Thank you so much, sir. Uh, I would uh, formally introduce Dr. Santosh, although he needs no introduction. He is uh, familiar to each one of us as the editor of Indian Journal of Ophthalmology, which uh, reaches every month at our uh, desktops and laptops and uh, also in our houses if we want it. Uh, uh, it is a pleasure and uh, it is a pleasure to be associated with Dr. Santosh whom I have known for last so many years uh, by the virtue of the fact that he was doing his uh, residency training in ophthalmology at uh, RP Center when I had also joined as a post-graduation. Following this, uh, he did a senior residency in ophthalmic plastic surgery and ocular oncology uh, at RP Center, uh, New Delhi Ames. He trained in ocular oncology and was mentored by Professor Jerry Shields and Professor Carol Shields at the Wills Eye Hospital, Philadelphia, USA. He established the Ocular Oncology Service at LV Prasad Eye Institute, Hyderabad, the first such facility in the country. And at that time, he was also the Associate Director of LVPI and also helped to establish the residency program. He currently heads the Department of Ophthalmic Plastic Surgery and Ocular Oncology and National Retino Retinoblastoma Foundation at Center for Sight, Hyderabad, and leads the medical services team and the CFS education. He has published extensively in the field of oculoplasty as well as in the field of retinoblastoma. And he's among the top 2% in the world and top 10 Indian ophthalmologists in the research output. I think uh, the, the list of the awards and the honors that he holds is uh, uh, just endless. But just to name a few, uh, Rangachari medal by the AIOS in 1992, Siva Reddy International Award by AIOS 2007, extremely coveted, Shanti Swarup Bhatnagar Award by the Government of India in 2010, a Professor M. A. Mateen Award by Bangladesh Academy of Ophthalmology in 2013, Jerry Shields International Award by the APO 2013, APO Distinguished Service Award 2018, and Peters Rogers Oration uh, ANZ SOPS 2019. He is the only Indian ophthalmologist to be uh, bestowed upon the Lifetime Achievement Award by American Academy of Ophthalmology in 2019 at such a young age and the prestigious honorary fellowship of the Royal College of Ophthalmologists London, UK 2020. Uh, he is uh, currently the editor of IGO but has very nicely and beautifully brought out the IGO case reports as well uh, since January uh, 2021. So thank you Santosh for agreeing to do this. And he is going to be talking about Retinoblastoma 2021, they live and see. So over to Santosh Hunavar. Is it good? Yeah. Thank you, sir, for uh, the uh, for allowing me to work on retinoblastoma in Center of Sight. And thank you, Namrita, for the uh, kind introduction and for uh, you know setting this up. This is very important because we should know about retinoblastoma, which uh, very easily curable condition where we can save life, eye and vision. These are the reasons why we should know about retinoblastoma because it's the most common primary intraocular malignancy in children. It's a deadly tumor with the potential for up to 50% death, but at the same time, it is curable to the extent of 98 to 99%. So if we treat it well from 50% death, we can convert that prognosis to 99% factor. It presents to mostly an ophthalmologist first, not to pediatricians generally, and it's completely curable. If you look at the world retinoblastoma map, you find that India is in dark blue, which is a hotspot. So India possibly has the highest incidence in retinoblastoma, especially because of its high live birth rate. Estimated number of cases in uh, India are about 1,500 to 2,000 every year out of which only about uh, 600 to 800 reach a retinoblastoma treatment center, which means that rest of them are being managed at primary or secondary levels or not being managed at all with a very high mortality. World Retinoblastoma Awareness Week is mainly because we understand that awareness is the key to early diagnosis and success in the management of retinoblastoma. This one slide shows the evolution of retinoblastoma from 98% mortality that we had just about 100 years ago. We have 98% survival, all because of these modalities of management which evolved over a period of time. 
let's start off with the clinical manifestations of retinoblastoma leukocoria is the most important presenting symptom and sign in retinoblastoma about 40% of children present with a white reflex and this is generally seen by the parents so awareness is very important because it's an obvious symptom and it's an obvious sign for an ophthalmologist and a pediatrician very striking leukocoria despite a normal sized pupil or these eyes obviously have less vision and the pupil may be slightly dilated when facing light or sun and this is very evident to parents squint is also very evident to parents and that's also one awareness if a child were to have squint then the child should see an ophthalmologist squint presents in about 20% of patients with retinoblastoma and very few have reduced vision reduced vision happens when the tumor is in the macular area or if there is subretinal fluid and the child who is verbal can only complain of reduced vision preverbal children cannot complain so it is not such a important symptom redness is red eye which doesn't go away with conventional treatment may harbor a tumor with neovascular glaucoma and that also needs attention this is very evident and very rare fortunately proptosis orbital retinoblastoma is only about 6 to 10% in india whereas in some of the african countries it's very high and fungating mass is very rarely seen now this is a spectrum of manifestations of retinoblastoma starts off with a posterior polar tumor in a newborn it could be a peripheral tumor in a slightly older child when it fills about 40 50% of the eye presents with leukocoria then that is proptosis that is extraocular extension sometimes there is tumor necrosis causing sterile inflammation resulting in orbital cellulitis and a fungating tumor as we know about the signs of retinoblastoma we should also know about the mask rats if a child were to have what looks like orbital cellulite it's always a good idea to do a ultrasound b scan or a ct scan to see if there is a tumor in the eye because aseptic necrosis of the tumor can result in orbital cellulitis if a child were to have a white eye uveitis you can see there is no circumciliary congestion here there is no conjunctival congestion yet the child has hypopion this is a sure shot sign of retinoblastoma a white eye hypopion and if a child were to have unilateral or bilateral what looks like congenital or developmental glaucoma large corneas but if the reflex is not really red or pink then that could be retinoblastoma again in a eye that has gone into thysis for no known reason or with minor trauma it could harbor retinoblastoma so you should do a scan and then see if this thysical eye has an intraocular calcification in the vitreous whereas if a thysical eye were to have calcification in the coats sclerocoroid then that is dystrophic calcification that does not signify retinoblastoma but if the calcification is right in the eye then that most possibly retinoblastoma you should consider that possibility and never eviscerate a thysical eye or atrophic eye in in a child you should rather enucleate Hypoma can also be a manifestation of retinoblastoma. This child came with a history of injury to the eye with a tree branch. She even has a lid laceration, small lid laceration to support that kind of a history. But you find full chamber hypoma, which was drained by a glaucoma specialist, and six months later she comes with an extraocular extension, regional lymph node metastasis, and intracranial extension. So hypoma can be a mask rat. So is vitreous hemorrhage. vitreous hemorrhage where the blood vessels caliber is altered dilated tortuous blood vessels with congestion of the disc can be a sign of a diffuse infiltrative retinoblastoma which is specifically seen in older children this child has no mass so to say it's a flat thickening of the retina placoid thickening of the retina but on histopath also you find that there is no major mass but diffuse thickening of the retina which is nearly twice the size of the normal retina which signifies diffuse infiltrative retinoblastoma a special type of tumor seen in older children now uh, these are the mask rats of course in one slide so what are the clinical types of retinoblastoma intraocular tumor it is most commonly endophytic which is seen in about 60 to 70% of patients where the tumor grows into the vitreous exophytic is when the child presents with subretinal fluid and subretinal seeds endophytic is a tumor which presents with vitreous seed and the third variant is diffuse infiltrative and a mixed configuration which has a bit of this and bit of that diagnosis is extremely simple all you need is a good examination under anesthesia 
periphery, especially ora serrata, has to be checked 360 degree by indentation twice over in both the eyes, which is mandatory. If you have any doubt about the diagnosis, you can do an ultrasound B scan, which shows high reflectivity because of calcium. And then a CT scan if you really want to look for calcium. But MRI is indicated if you want to look for extraocular extension, optic nerve extension, and screen a child with uh, bilateral or unilateral multifocal retinoblastoma for pineloblastoma and optic nerve invasion as well. So MRI has a very good indication in as the baseline investigation in retinoblastoma. There are lesions that simulate retinoblastoma as well. These are the top five simulators, Coates disease, PHPV, toxocariasis, astrocytic hematoma, and medulloepithelium. If a child were to have a golden yellow reflex like this, striking, striking vascularization, which is uh, different from retinoblastoma, which just dips into the tumor here, you find that there is peripheral retinal telangiectasia, then that is Coates disease. You can see the stark difference in the kind of reflex in Coates disease versus retinoblastoma. Coates reflex is golden yellow or brown, yellowish, that is xanthocoria, whereas in retinoblastoma, it is leukocoria, that is white. This is the kind of difference in blood vessels in Coates versus retinoblastoma, segmental dilatation of the blood vessels with peripheral lateral telangiectasia, whereas in RB, it simply dips into the tumor, a uniformly large caribou speed of blood vessel. In PHPV, there is relative microphthalmus and also ciliary processes are evident and there is a posterior polar cataract, whereas in retinoblastoma, that doesn't happen. Retinoblastoma is very uncommon in microphthalmic eyes. And of course, ultrasonography confirms the diagnosis. In toxocariasis, if it's a peripheral toxocariasis, can have calcification, but that falciform fold fractional element is very typical for toxocariasis. In RB, there is no traction. In a central toxocariasis, again, there is intralesional calcification and can simulate retinoblastoma, but dragging of the retina or dragging of the disc, as they call it, because of desmoplastic activity is typical for toxocariasis. Retinal astrocytoma can mimic small retinoblastoma, like this patient who has retinoblastoma, I means sorry, astrocytic hematoma, uh, right next to the optic disc. But the difference is that astrocytic hematoma obscures the blood vessels, retinal blood vessels. Whereas if it were to be retinoblastoma, blood vessels would be seen within it. And this kind of a calcification is also known in astrocytic hematoma, but these are large globules of calcification which is atypical for retinoblastoma. So that's how you clinically differentiate. And of course, systemic association of NF1 and tuberous sclerosis also helps you differentiate. This is the nature of calcification in retinoblastoma. It's quite dense, whereas this is like fish egg kind of calcification, the rim calcification of these lesions. Medulloepithelioma presents with a peripheral tumor, but then zonules are missing. This is because the tumor is developed uh, during embryogenesis and zonules in that area are typically missing, resulting in lens coloboma, whereas that doesn't happen in retinoblastoma. Coming on to classification, we all need a classification system which should be very simple and easy to recall. And more importantly, it should be applicable to current therapeutic modalities. After all, why do you need to do classification? You want to tell a parent that, okay, your child has uh, this percentage of I salvage or this percentage of life salvage, roughly you have to be able to give that figure. That is why you need to stage and group. Every cancer has staging and grouping, whereas for staging, survival of the patient or life salvage is the outcome. For grouping, the organ salvage or I salvage is the outcome. This is the international staging system for retinoblastoma, where stage zero is the eye which has been conservatively managed, no inucleation. Stage one is when enucleation is performed and the tumor is completely resected. And the pathologist tells you that the tumor is completely resected. So there is a good role for an ophthalmic oncopathologist in the management of retinoblastoma. When a patient has been managed with enucleation with microscopic residual tumor, that is stage two. And stage three is orbital disease or regional lymph node extension, A and B. And stage four is metastatic retinoblastoma hematogenous or CNS. Until stage three, there is excellent prognosis. In fact, survival can be as high as 90% even in orbital retinoblastoma. That's the watershed zone. Beyond stage three, in stage four, there is dismal prognosis. Results worth 
grouping is no longer used. It was meant, it served its purpose. It was meant for prognostication of radiation and eye salvage. Whereas radiation is no longer used uh, as the uh, standard of care in retinoblastoma. That's why results worth has gone out of vogue. And what we currently have is international grouping of intraocular retinoblastoma, which is a simple classification, kindergarten classification, where if the tumor is less than three millimeter, it is group A. Tumor more than three millimeter in macular location or juxtapapillary location or with subretinal fluid goes to group B. C are tumors with focal subretinal seeds or focal vitreous seeds. We know that subretinal seeds occur in exophytic retinoblastoma and vitreous seeds occur in endophytic retinoblastoma. When these seeds are diffused, diffuse subretinal seeds or diffuse vitreous seeds that goes to group D. Whereas if the tumor is more than 50% of the ocular volume, neovascular glaucoma, blood in the anterior chamber or vitreous or invasion goes to group E. This is the TNM classification, AGCC classification, edition 8. What is new about this is that for the first time in oncology for any cancer, a H category has been added. TNM is al already known, tumor node metastasis. H is for heritability. This is very special for retinoblastoma because heritability has a lot of role to play in uh, managing retinoblastoma, at least in families. Coming on to management. In the West, retinoblastoma has been a success story. 98% survival, over 90% I salvage. In developing countries, mortality is more than 50%. Can we bridge this gap by using management protocols that are easy and simple to follow and also less expensive? Let's look at that. Goals are, of course, salvage of life is a primary goal. Salvage of the organ, that's I, is the secondary goal and salvage of function or optimal residual vision is the tertiary goal. These are the treatment modalities that are available. They can be simply classified as focal, local, and systemic. When a tumor is very small, say two or three millimeter in diameter and two or three millimeter in thickness, we know that there is no risk to life, there is no risk to eye. Then we concentrate on vision salvage. There is no point bombarding the patient with aggressive treatment if the tumor is small, because we know that we have to salvage vision. How do we do that? We can do cryotherapy for a peripheral tumor. Like this patient has a small tumor in the periphery, cryoed easily, and it goes away. But you can note that the size of the scar is much larger than the tumor that you began with. That happens because we do cryotherapy very aggressively. It's a triple freeze thaw cryotherapy. This is the tumor that has been elevated on tip of a three millimeter cryoprobe. That is a tumor that has been elevated and centered. And the ice ball that is formed is so large. You can see the, this is the ice ball that is formed. And that is the vitreous right on top of it, which is condensed. So that is aggressive cryotherapy, which we need to do to take care of retinoblastoma. That's why the scar is large like this, which is okay in the nasal periphery. But what if the patient has a tumor slightly posterior, slightly anterior to the equator in, on the temple side? There is a risk for traction on the macula, epiretinal membrane formation, etc. So cryo is to be very cautiously used. What about photocoagulation? The principle of photocoagulation is animization or cutting of the blood supply of the tumor. How is it done? By doing laser, large diameter laser burns, which are confluent all around the tumor. So what happens as a side effect of laser is this blood vessel, which is passing through the tumor, gets coagulated. So there is a possibility of visual field defect in patients who have uh, undergone photocoagulation, small blood vessel block. And if this were to be a juxtapapillary lesion, then there is a large visual field defect. And if you were to accidentally do laser on top of the tumor, then there is rupture of the internal limiting membrane resulting in vitreous seat. And because you're coagulating the blood vessel, if you do it along with chemotherapy, then it reduces chemotherapy uptake. These are the complications of photocoagulation. So photocoagulation has been given up. It's no longer used. And what we use when using a laser is thermotherapy. Laser thermotherapy, which is a very gentle form of laser, which induces increase in intratumoral temperature by about 45 to 60 degrees centigrade. What it causes is gentle tumor cell apoptosis, resulting in a scar which is no larger than the tumor itself. Why is it so? That's because TTT is done right on top of the lesion, not around it. 
and there is no risk of ilm rupture because you are doing it on top of the tumor you can see this minute blood vessels which are very well preserved despite a flat scar following ttd of course ttd needs three or four sessions but the worth of ttd is in the fact that there are very few complications what new about ttd is icg enhanced ttd or photodynamic ttd because these work in synergy ttd uses semiconductor diode laser a red laser and when icg is injected just before ttd if if the tumor were to lie over a amelanotic or a non pigmented scar or on top of calcium that works much better so you can see the tumor gone there following icg enhanced ttd which gives good success about 80% regression in refractory tumors refractory in the sense that you have tried ttd earlier but it has not worked so photodynamic ttd is good for tumors on a non pigmented scar or a refractory to ttd and in focal therapy the principle is less is more that means lesser you do uh, in terms of intervention better is the visual outcome next is the local therapy local therapy is plaque breaking therapy mainly plug is uh, done in tumors which are slightly larger say 16 mm in diameter and 8 mm in thickness or for patients who have chemo reduction failures or for recurrences it's rarely performed as primary therapy this is a kind of a dosimetry isodose curves that you get with notch plug which is centered on the optic nerve so you can do it for juxtapapillary tumors also with very little dose to the optic nerve technique is very simple i'll skip the video just to show you the results you can see pre treatment juxtapapillary tumor post treatment a calcified scar but of course vision is a problem because this scar is right on the fovea this is again a juxtapapillary posterior polar lesion following plug break therapy again because of the location of the tumor vision is going to be suboptimal so plug is never done as a primary therapy it's done for recurrences or for refractory tumors those are its specific indications what new about plug is that we have an indian plug which is very inexpensive so it can be more commonly used now ebrt is no longer used it has lot of complications but the most important complication is second malignant neoplasm the risk of a patient developing a second malignant neoplasm if external beam radiation is done under a age of 12 months in a child with retinoblastoma bilateral cases or heritable cases is 35% whereas if you were not to do radiation then it is 6% so just by doing external beam radiation we are increasing the mortality by 29% in a child who has heritable retinoblastoma so ebrt is no longer favored as primary modality it can be used for salvage what changed the management of retinoblastoma there was a paradigm change that happened in november 1996 this was the archives of ophthalmology now called jama which published four articles on a new modality of management of retinoblastoma that's called chemotherapy then they called it chemo reduction because it resulted in reduction of the tumor size from four different groups this was published this revolutionized the management of retinoblastoma this is like going back to the past not in terms of treatment modality but the size of the tumor itself suppose you began with a 16 mm tumor with chemo reduction you could reduce it to 8 10 6 mm progressively and when it became 4 or 6 mm you could start laser therapy to make the size of the scar smaller we began earlier in 1996 with standard dose intravenous chemotherapy now over a period of time all these modalities of chemotherapy have evolved we have high dose chemotherapy we have different indications new adjuvant chemotherapy and adjuvant chemotherapy which were not there in 1996 we have intra arterial chemotherapy we have periocular chemotherapy we have injections and epi bulbar drug delivery system we have intravitreal and intracameral chemotherapy as well intravenous chemotherapy uses three drugs carboplatin etoposide and vincristine three to four weekly this is the effect this there are two tumors here one here and one here and after treatment you can see the scar is much smaller than the tumor that you began with So the first effect of intravenous chemotherapy or any form of chemotherapy be it intravenous or intra arterial is that the scar becomes much smaller than the tumor that you began with this is the scar of the tumor that was lying in the supratemporal aspect so macular fovea is exposed thus maximizing vision the second principle is that tumor always regresses towards its primary source of blood supply for example here 
the supratemporal arcade is the source of breath supply and the tumor has regressed towards it thus freeing the fovea see it was abutting the foveola here now the foveola is completely free and healthy in fact after the second cycle of chemotherapy itself foveola got free which means that the patient has a good potential for vision suppose if we were to treat this patient with any other modality there would be scar in the foveal area the speckloading good patient so that is the second principle of chemotherapy the third is that subretinal fluid goes away very rapidly after the first or second cycle of chemotherapy there is settled retina generally settles down thus again maximizing vision so it shrinks the tumor it regresses towards the source of its vascularity which is away from the macula fovea and extractive retinoblastoma extractive uh, component of uh, retinoblastoma settles down so it was a standard of care until early 2000s and after that a change came in again and the change was in the form of high dose chemotherapy high dose chemotherapy is mainly because the standard dose chemotherapy has slightly low success in advanced tumors and in developing countries such as india we find advanced tumors which are more common than group c or early group d tumors so in those we started using high dose chemotherapy and again periocular chemotherapy to increase the intravitreal concentration of the drug same drugs but with a higher dose was much better effective in for group d and group b tumors these are some of the examples of patients treated with high dose chemotherapy total rd regressed and the tumor is on its way to regression as well one more example a large tumor regressed completely with high dose chemotherapy it was relatively more effective but the incidence of uh, say uh, bone marrow suppression or need for blood transfusion or granulocytic colony stimulating factor was higher so these has to be used very carefully then came in intra arterial chemotherapy simultaneously while we were using high dose chemotherapy there was an additional development that happened in the realm of intra arterial chemotherapy currently it is an established technique it's expensive the technology is available in india and we are very good at doing it but only thing that holds us back from doing it routinely is the expense this is how we do it we use a 400 micron catheter which is introduced into the internal carotid artery by a femoral axis and the uh, catheter peeps into the ophthalmic artery at which point in time we inject the drug conventionally melphalan was used but we use three drugs mainly because with three drugs we find much better efficacy and the need for the number of cycles of intra arterial chemotherapy goes down thus reducing the expense we use topotecan melphalan and carboplatin the effect is dramatic total retinal detachment settled for a one cycle of intra arterial chemotherapy a large tumor regresses very rapidly so because of its rapid regression these children have a slightly better visual prognosis with intra arterial chemotherapy one more similar example of intra arterial chemotherapy it can be used for recurrences as well this was a child with recurrence for which intra arterial was used what are the success rates this is the series of us which we recently analyzed where we found that in group b of course there is 100% success group c also has 100% success the best advantage of intra arterial chemotherapy is in group d in group d retinoblastoma there is about 50 to 75% success with conventional treatment but with intra arterial we have 90 plus success uh, of i salvage group e is a modest success group e especially bad group e has about 50 to 60% success whereas with conventional treatment it's about 25% success so it's mainly in group d and e that intra arterial chemotherapy has better success and of course as a secondary measure for i salvage it has excellent success 96% which means that if intra uh, venous chemotherapy has failed in such patients if you use intra arterial chemotherapy or for recurrences then you have a much better i salvage cannulation success rate is nearly 98% cost is the only barrier so it does make a difference for group d and e retinoblastoma and for larger recurrences and there is no point using intra arterial chemotherapy for group b or c unless you want a rapid uh, visual recovery the next aspect of retinoblastoma is the vitreous seeds now how do vitreous seeds form there are two mechanisms of formation of vitreous seeds one is break in the internal limiting membrane which can happen naturally because of tumor evolution or with inter intervention such as laser photocoagulation second is sprouting of vitreous seeds 
you can see on uh, imaging here that vitreous seed is sprouting from an endophytic tumor. So when there is break in the internal limiting membrane, the size of the vitreous seeds is smaller. Whereas if it is sprouting, then the size of the vitreous seed is larger. That is the only difference. Otherwise, there is hardly any difference. Now, because of uh, Professor Munia, who's worked extensively on vitreous seeds, is a vitreous seed man. We understand some more about vitreous seeds. The growth pattern. One is called adherence independent growth. Adherence independent growth are the seeds which don't need any nutrition at all. That means that they can survive, survive on what nutrition they get from the vitreous. So if it is adherence independent growth, then they can form free floating spheres in the vitreous. Whereas if it is adherence dependent growth, then they have to settle down on the retina for nutrition and they form individual tumor seedlings. Earlier, we only knew about vitreous seeds. Now there are types of seeds that are there. Classic vitreous seeds, as we always knew. Now we have prehyloid, subhyloid, epiretinal, intraretinal, subretinal and intracameral seeds. Intracameral seeds are further classified as depository and infiltrative. These are the classic vitreous seeds. These, this is OTT classification, prehyloid, subhyloid, epiretinal, intraretinal, and subretinal. And this extensive categorization is required to prognosticate. Depository anterior chamber seeds are the ones which come from the vitreous through the zonules and settle in the anterior chamber like this. These are very easy to treat. Whereas if it's infiltrative because of infiltration of the ciliary body, then that's difficult to treat. Morphological classification, dust when the seeds are very small and in the form of a dust. Cloud are finer seeds, which actually form a haze in the vitreous or kind of haze that you see in vitritis. Spears, as the name indicates, are large balls of vitreous seeds. Mixed is a configuration where all of these are present in different configurations. How do we treat vitreous seeds? When the vitreous seeds are present and the retinal tumor is viable, then we have to resort to chemotherapy as the sheet anchor of management. Along with that, we cannot give intraocular chemotherapy, so we give periocular chemotherapy. When the retinal tumor is nearly totally regressed and there are viable vitreous seeds, then we go on to intravitreal chemotherapy. So with this slide, what I want to indicate is that if the retinal tumor is viable, then obviously we cannot give intravitreal chemotherapy. If the retinal tumor is nearly regressed, then we can get into the vitreous safely. Periocular chemotherapy or deep posterior subtenance chemotherapy used carboplatin earlier, but because of its fibroblastic uh, complications or uh, you know extraocular muscle fibrosis, tenens fibrosis and conjunctival fibrosis, etc. we have shifted to topotecan. The way we give it is the same. We choose a quadrant which is suprotemporal, except suprotemporal, any other quadrant can be chosen. Suprotemporal is not used because of uh, lacrimal gland uh, affection. It is injected deep posterior subtenens and the tumor and the, uh, the drug that is deposited should not egress to touch the cornea. So that's important that you occlude the port or the site of injection with a cotton tip replicator before you apply ointment on the cornea. The effect is very good, but not uh, uh, as good as intravitreal chemotherapy. These are all patients who have been successfully treated with periocular chemotherapy in the times when uh, intravitreal chemotherapy was still not available. Very good success in this patient. Balls of vitreous seeds gone following uh, this particular treatment. It works well in about 60 to 70 percent of patients. This was the data that we had published with the carboplatin. This was the data that we recently published with topic and 60 to 70 percent. For uh, tumors, uh, when the tumor has regressed, but the vitreous seeds of the are injection present, confirmed by a careful indirect ophthalmoscopy. Hypotony is, is achieved by applying gentle pressure over the eye for a few seconds. Under aseptic precautions, the eye is draped. After placing the lid speculum, pass planar is marked at an appropriate distance away from the limbus. Age-based method was used to determine the safe site for injection. Under the guidance of operating microscope, a 32-gauge needle mounted on the tuberculin syringe is introduced into the center of the vitreous. 
the needle is steadily held in place and appropriate dose is injected gently. A 3 mm cryoprobe is applied to the puncture site with the needle still steadily held in position. The needle is withdrawn through the consolidated ice ball that forms around its base, thus precluding fluid reflex through the puncture site. Triple freeze thaw cryotherapy is performed at the injection site. So how do we make the intravitreal injection safe? So you do it when the retinal tumor is not large. Choose a safe site away from any tumor or a tumor scar or a tumor residue. So suppose the tumor is residual in the infronasal quadrant, we go farthest away, 180 degree away to suprotemporal quadrant. Always exit through the ice ball as was shown in the video. Injection site cryotherapy is a safeguard. And there's a technique called death by water where you irrigate the ocular surface with water, distilled water for about two to three minutes. And some surgeons believe in raising a blev of subconjunctival carboplatin to minimize the risk of extraocular extension. With these modalities in place, intravitreal chemotherapy has become safe with minimal risk or no risk of extraocular extension. This was with Melphalan when we started off with receipts gone with melphalan, couple of injection. This is one more patient where there is a vitreous seeds gone with melphalan. But after a while, we started noticing that melphalan in Indian eyes or pigmented eyes has complications. This was a patient where vitreous seeds regressed, but the patient is left with a retinal pigment epithelial uh, atrophy and also atrophy of RP in the macular area, thus reducing his visual potential. We started noticing that intravitreal melphalan causes uveitis, cataract, needs weekly injections as per the protocol, thus uh, needing more EUAs and also has retinal toxicity. Whereas intravitreal topotecan is better in terms of its bioavailability, needs three weekly injections and hardly has any retinal toxicity. So we started using intravitreal topotecan. It's given in the dose of 30 microgram and every three weekly. This is a bunch of vitreous seeds gone after two injections. You can see a flat retinal scar and the vitreous is all, all gone and the macula is healthy. So intravitreal topotecan is very gentle. As you see fr from this example, diffuse vitreous seeds reduced after two doses of intravitreal topotecan. One more example of diffuse vitreous seeds after two injections. It needs about, on an average, about three injections. We can go up to six injections bunch of vitreous seeds gone after a couple of injections, a cloud of vitreous seeds completely calcified. And you can see again diffuse vitreous seeds regressed after intravitreal topotecan. Now this is a patient where there was a large tumor with extensive vitreous seeds and subretinal seeds right up to the ora serrata you can see on indentation. Following complete treatment, intravenous chemotherapy, in periocular chemotherapy and intravitreal topotecan, you can see macula is fairly healthy, optic disc is healthy, tumor is completely calcified and all the vitreous seeds calcified. So this was an eye which could have been enucleated about four or five years ago, now can be easily salvaged. We also use topotecan along with low-dose uh, melphalan along with topotecan in patients who are refractory. Like this patient has a large bunch of vitreous seeds Following intravenous chemotherapy, it is regressed partially, but not completely. Following intravitreal topotecan, it has further regressed, but there is residual. But when you bring in, bring in the combination of topotecan with melphalan, that is also gone. But note that there is RP atrophy. So this is a complication of melphalan, even in low dose. One more example of a patient where there was diffractive vitreous seeding following intravitreal topotecan. Now, when we introduce melphalan, that became calcified. So we can use a combination of topotecan and melphalan as a treatment for refractory vitreous seeds. One more similar example. So what is the success of topotecan? Initially, when we reported, we had 100% success. But currently, we have about 70 to 80 or even 90% success, depending on the extent of vitreous seeds and the presence of a residual tumor. So success is lesser now because we are using it extensively earlier we were using it only in very selected cases now what are the regression patterns with vitreous seeds this is by munier again regression pattern of vitreous seeds type 0 is complete disappearance 
Conversion into calcified seeds is called type 1A. Crystalline refringent dust is called type 1B. Amorphous non-spherical seeds is type 2. And combination of regression pattern 1 and 2 is type 3. These are some of the uh, pictures that show the regression pattern. Now, intraocular chemotherapy, we have extending indications. Earlier, we were using it for vitreous seeds only. Now, we use it for depository seeds as well. This is an anterior chamber depository seed. Earlier, we were enucleating such patients. Now, with intracameral chemotherapy or intravitreal topotecan, they can regress. Another patient with depository seeds regress following intracameral chemotherapy. One more indication that we have found is for subretinal seeds. Like this patient has large subretinal seeds, confluent subretinal seeds. We were lasering them earlier, thus resulting in scars like this. This is a patient where subretinal seeds have been lasered and you find large scars. But when you use intravitreal chemotherapy for subretinal seeds, there is no scar. So subretinal seeds can also be treated with intravitreal chemotherapy. You can see all this is gone with intravitreal chemotherapy. One more example of subretinal seeds resolved with intravitreal chemotherapy. So RB seeds seem to have been finally conquered. About 15 minutes left. So this is a patient uh, with unsalvageable retinoblastoma where obviously we have to resort to enucleation. Now with the current forms of therapy that are available, even eyes with un unsalvageable retinoblastoma can be managed. Like this patient who had a larger cornea and neovascular glaucoma following multimodal treatment has regressed and his eye is salvaged. This is a patient where there is orbital extension of retinoblastoma. Earlier, we would do multimodal treatment followed by extended enucleation. Now, even with patients with limited orbital retinoblastoma, there is a scope for eye salvage as it has happened here. It is about 60% chance. But then I wouldn't recommend that we should try it in all patients, but it should be very judicious and do it only when there is no risk to life. With all this put together, the prognosis is improved. We have about 90% eye salvage in group 5A retinoblastoma and 80% in group 5B retinoblastoma. In eyes which cannot be salvaged, such as eyes with severe unilateral retinoblastoma with neovascular glaucoma, anterior chamber infiltration, then we resort to enucleation. Now, in, before we do enucleation, we have to consider what are the clinical risk factors. This is a list of clinical risk factors, neovascular glaucoma, anterior chamber in segment infiltration, ciliary body infiltration, high FEMA, vitreous hemorrhage, ophthalmos, and sterile infiltration. If sterile inflammation, if these are present, then there's a role for neoadjuvant chemotherapy. It may not improve prognosis in terms of life salvage, but it makes enucleation easier and possible. Such as patients with severe sterile inflammation, if you were, were to try to do enucleation in an eye like this, then the risk of scleral perforation. You can see how severe is periscleral inflammation or inflammation in the orbit. In these patients, we give neoadjuvant chemotherapy, make the eye get into atrophy or thysis, and then do a safe enucleation. Enucleation is performed with a refined technique where we should ensure that we get the longest possible optic nerve stem and also place a primary implant so that cosmosis can be achieved and parents are happy that the child has at least got the cosmosis back. We use the myoconjunctival technique where we suture the muscle just short of uh, their, this phonesis, respective phonesis. There's a video that shows the myoconjunctival technique. The first step is to do a small lateral canthotomy. We don't do a cantholysis lateral canthotomy and 360 degree peritomy very close to the limbus so that to, uh, we can conserve the conjunctiva and then we dissect the tenons in oblique meridia between the recti that's dissection of the anterior and posterior tenons then we tag extraocular muscles with silk, just short of its insertion not to go to the insertion and not to risk Scleral perforation. Second tag suture with a 6 o y grill about 6 to 8 millimeter away and the muzzle is disinserted. Medial rectus first followed by inferior, lateral and superior in that order. Then the superior oblique and the inferior oblique. All uh, disinserted using a RF electrode so that there is good hemostasis. 
then a small conjunctival relaxing incision. Then the eyeball is prolapsed through the blades of the speculum, so the optic nerve is at stretch. The tenotomy scissor, gently curved, 15 degree curved tenotomy scissor is introduced between the lateral rectus and the eyeball, eyes ball, uh, eyeball, and the optic nerve is strummed and cut. Just the optic nerve is cut, no other structure in the orbit is cut. Those are the dilated vertex veins that are inspected and the length of the optic nerve is measured. So we always uh, mark the areas of the eye which are potentially having histopathological risk factors. Posterior tenancers closed with the uh, ictovitreal sutures, closely placed suture. There are three barriers to the implant that is posterior tenance, that's the myoconjunctival suture just short of the respective furnaces. This is a double arm suture using the tag suture that we had already placed in the muzzle. Then the anterior tenons is closed. And finally, conjunctiva is closed with continuous key pattern suture. And at the end of the procedure, a conformer is placed and a suture task trophy is performed. So these are the precautions that we take to get a long optic nostrum, lateral canthotomy and a relaxing incision in the conjunctiva. Make sure that the extraocular muscles are transected completely. No fiber of the extraocular muscle should be left. Otherwise, it will hold the eye back. Prolapse the eyeball through the blades of the speculum or use traction sutures and use traction sutures. Avoid enucleation, spoon and scissor, which take a lot of space, but use a gently curved tenotomy scissor or a 15 degree curved tenotomy scissor if you were to do a lateral approach. For example, if you were to do a lateral approach, since the lateral orbital wall is at 45 degree, Use a gently curved tenotomy scissor. But if you were to do from the medial side, you have to use a nearly straight scissor. Otherwise, you will get a shorter optic nerve stump. Then, preferably lateral approach because you get a longer stump. Stump the optic nerve and cut it just short of the apex. If you cut it right at the apex, there will be bleeding because you will be cutting through the superior orbital fissure structures. And also, the child may lose motility because you will be cutting through the nerves that are in the superior orbital fissure. In critical cases where you have to cut the optic nerve right at the orbital apex, then you can do a small lateral orbitotomy. There's a 20 millimeter, 22 millimeter long stump in a patient who had optic nerve extension. And post enucleation, you look at the optic nerve very critically, look at the optic nerve sheath, and also mark areas which may have potential histopathological risk factors, like a dilated vertex vein, an area of sclera that is showing a bulge or area of sclera that is showing thinning like this, or scleral induration, because pathologists have to take sections through those areas to detect high risk factors, otherwise they may miss it. High risk factors are extremely important, otherwise 20 to 30 percent of children can still die despite primary enucleation. In Asian Indian eyes, the incidence of high risk factors is up to 52 percent. What are the high risk factors? Anterior segment invasion, ciliary body invasion, Massive choroidal invasion, which is more than 3 millimeter in diameter and 3 millimeter in thickness. Optic nerve invasion beyond the lamina cribrosa or optic nerve invasion to transection. All these patients with histopathological risk factors should get adjuvant chemotherapy. And if a patient were to have extraocular extension or optic nerve transaction involvement, then additional radiotherapy has to be given. Does it really help? There were various studies, but in the study that we did in 19... Uh, 2002, we found that uh, if the child were not to get adjuvant therapy, then the risk of metastasis is as high as 24%. But if the child were to get adjuvant therapy, then the risk of metastasis is reduced to 4%. So just by doing histopathology, finding out the histopathological risk factors and giving adjuvant therapy, the risk for death can be reduced by a good 20%. So it's a very good survival advantage by adjuvant therapy. This was confirmed by a multicentric study by Children's Oncology Group, which also endorsed the fact that uh, choroidal invasion and optic nerve invasion of more than 1.5 millimeter warrant adjuvant chemotherapy. So, enucleation is not the end of management of retinoblastoma. Last part is about orbital retinoblastoma. Fortunately, we have a relatively less incidence of 6 to 30 percent, whereas in some of African countries, it's up to 60 percent. It falls into group. 3A of uh, international uh, classification and CT4 of TNM classification. There are five types. Primary is when the child presents with an orbital retinoblastoma. Secondary is when the child develops orbital retinoblastoma following enucleation or a recurrence. Accidental is when somebody does intraocular surgery 
and then the child develops obstructive retinoblastoma overt is when you find it during enucleation if the imaging modalities don't show it up microscopic is when the pathology tells you that there is full thickness scleral invasion as you see here or extraocular extension or optic nerve invasion to transection it used to have a very high mortality 70% but with the current multimodal treatment where we begin with new adjuvant chemotherapy like this child with orbital retinoblastoma after new adjuvant chemotherapy i has gone into thysis as you see here from proptosis to thysis and the orbital component has resolved then we do a enucleation with a long optic nerve stump give stereotactic radiation to the orbit and continue adjuvant chemotherapy for total number of cycles which is 12 even for optic nerve extension like this patient has a thick optic nerve right at the orbital apex there is a solution in the form of multimodal treatment for anterior intracranial extension to cavernous sinus involvement which were earlier considered hopeless now can be cured with multimodal treatment and after six cycles of neoadjuvant chemotherapy all that is left is at the superior orbital fissure which is amenable to radiation of course the child would need would need enucleation this is an example of a child who has been completely treated a older child with orbital retinoblastoma she did not need orbital excentration she is hale and hearty with just a extended enucleation one more example of a child with secondary orbital retinoblastoma did not need excentration that's the implant right there and a good custom ocular prosthesis so orbital rb also has a cure just five more minutes samrita no you take your time santosh i think it's going on really very well please carry on so final prognosis in uh, our series 95% was a life salvage uh, and about 5% of children succumb 3% of children succumb to the disease and 2% succumb to uh, two, sorry 2% succumb to metastasis and 3% were alive with metastasis that means that their treatment is still on so 95% is the life salvage what about eye and vision salvage Overall, 36% of patients needed primary enucleation. This was about uh, five, six years ago. But currently, the number of children who need primary enucleation has reduced to about less than 10%. Chemo reduction results in 90% eye salvage, and 95% of patients who have eye salvage have vision salvage, where vision could be measured reliably. 50% have vision more than or equal to 20 by 40. This depends solely on the location of the tumor. If the macular or a Tumor around the optic disc. Obviously, vision is going. Children who are undergoing treatment, very happy children, very minimal complications with chemotherapy, especially in their mother. Very good. What is your name? The voice. Can you tell me? Yeah. What is your name? What is your name? Tell me your name. Tell me your name. नाम बताओ तुम्हारा नाम बताओ वेरी नाइस ये तुम्हारा दोस्त है हाँ शेक हम करो हम शेक करो तो दिस चाइल्ड इज प्लेइंग वेल एंड ही इज ड्रॉइंग एज वेल एंड लुक एट इज कार एक्सटेंसिव रेक्टोब्लास्टोमा ट्रीटेड and he has residual vision enough to draw so well so that is the kind of gratification that we get and this child is into music now she has a c juxta papillary or a macular tumor with the macular scar she is able to do everything that a normal child would do start so i am mr teacher teachers, teachers. today i am going to tell you a lesson about to a apple and h And if you assume that their vision is so Hiru, poor with the macular tumor, you can see. Achcha, achcha, achcha. 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 all right so basically what it means is that even with a scar of this sort children are able to see with whatever little healthy macular phobia that is left so no eye should be given up in the management of retinoblastoma 
there are of course social economic barriers but we have uh, good support from iksha foundation and can kids can kids is a major support for us they take care of logistics they take care of funding for poor children with all this and we call them very relentlessly my fellows call them and we have about 90% compliance success despite covid 90% of children are actually coming back to treatment regularly so future prospects of course are in genetics this is slide from brinda galley where you can know uh, that there is retinoblastoma prenatally and then induce a early delivery and then treat the tumor as it develops this is what dr galley has done and we can do similar things as well with genetics being very extensively available what's really new is non invasive pre implantation screening that means if a child were to have bilateral retinoblastoma or heritable retinoblastoma when he becomes an adult his or her children need not have retinoblastoma because of this in vitro fertilization and pre implantation screening this can avoid retinoblastoma in generations and this technology has been you can tell from a child's eyes if he's happy when he said frightened or when he's asleep you can tell many things from a child's eyes including if he's got cancer Finally, everything happens on apps these days. There's an app, app called Cradle. There's an iPhone and an Android app. Parents can simply download this and take a picture through the app. And if there's a leukocoria, the app analyzes the eye as normal and white eye. And if it's a white eye, you can go to a pediatric ophthalmologist or an ophthalmologist for initial screening. So parents who have a suspicion that the eye child's eye may have an abnormal reflex or has an abnormal reflex on photographs can run the photographs through this app which is freely downloadable Cradle app. So we have apps to detect retinoblastoma. So so far in the last one hour, I took you to the bottom of the sea and then gave you a lot of information. You might be gasping for breath. So let me bring you back to the surface, very tranquil surface, just to give you take home points for life salvage. what we have achieved 98% 95% life salvage is mainly because of new adjuvant chemotherapy adjuvant chemotherapy and multimodal treatment these have become available since the last 10 years or so and these have really increased the survival from 90% we have gone up to 98% because of these three modalities that's about life salvage in eye salvage because of intra arterial chemotherapy intra vitreal chemotherapy we could push from 70% to 90% that's a major jump of about 20% just because of these two modalities of course brachytherapy always helps and in vision salvage again we have intra arterial and intra vitreal chemotherapy especially topotecan melflan causes loss of vision to not be used topotecan is a drug drug to go for icg enhanced ttt so 70% vision salvage to 90 to 95% vision salvage because of these three modalities which all have happened in the last 10 to 12 years so in conclusion i would say that early diagnosis is the key to success white reflex and squint are the most important signs and symptoms both can be easily noted by a comprehensive ophthalmologist or by a vision technician or an optometrist or by the parents themselves so general awareness is this key to uh, key screening of course if you want to be high tech then there is app based screening as well you have to identify maskers ophthalmologist role is to identify retinoblastoma and detect retinoblastoma when they encounter a mask card such as a white eye uveitis retinoblastoma management appears complex but it is individualized management by a team approach and the team consists of everybody including an ocular oncologist and an oncologist geneticist chemotherapy nurse radiation physicist it's an entire team and of course the pathologist current trend is towards chemotherapy and focal therapy with improving eye life and vision salvage intra arterial and intra vitreal chemotherapy have brought about a paradigm change in the management of retinoblastoma and these have resulted in eye and vision salvage and as far as life salvage is concerned what is very important is to do a good enucleation with the longest possible optic nerve stem identify histopathological risk factors following enucleation by doing a protocol based histopathology where just not the central pupillary optic callet but the lateral callets are also analyzed by a ocular oncopathologist 
followed by new adjuvant chemotherapy and for ret orbital retinoblastoma multimodal treatment so all these modalities are cost effective and are done by a multidisciplinary team centered around an ocular oncologist so these teams are always centered around an ocular oncology uh, specialist so that ocular oncologist can guide the rest of the specialist as to what treatment would be better for a given child ua is very important and has to be done at every visit with all this put together we can mirror eye life and vision salvage to what is seen in the west and and in the developed countries thank you so much thank you santosh uh, i think it was an i mean it is a mind blowing mind blowing presentation and it was like a atlas of uh, you know retinoblastoma which covered everything more so because so many things were in you know explained in just photographs with evidence and uh, with the videos uh, you are doing a great job i think what you not highlighted is that you developed a plaque uh, indian plaque uh, for uh, treating these cases and if you would like to say a few words before i take up uh, questions uh, just to highlight one more fact there is a huge viewership for this uh, webinar today with the uh, people from cambodia philippines bangladesh us europe all joining us so uh, would you like to highlight or say a few words about the plaque that you have you know uh, developed yourself with the indian company uh, taking the theme of make in india forward this is not developed by me it is a team actually it was bhava atomic research center uh, which is a government of india organization they had the ruthenium in their uh, waste uh, as a waste as a radioactive waste when they have reactors they have a radioactive waste and in that they detected that there was significant amount of ruthenium which they had to dispose of so they started extracting ruthenium from this radioactive waste and uh, we were talking and then they said that well we could make a radiation device out of it then i guided them regarding the design and they developed the technology to make it uh, totally in india with a very uh, useful technology very minimal technology uh, you know wealth from waste that kind of an, kind of an approach and expensive it cost about 5% of the cost of an imported plaque there are no importing hassles it's very readily available and any ophthalmologist can use it of course with certification and um, a team so uh, there are questions which are there on the youtube and the facebook uh, uh, channel and uh... one question is why does calcification occur in retinoblastoma calcification is dystrophic calcification when there is necrosis ne necrosis is always accompanied by calcifications in a rapidly growing tumor which is a round cell tumor there is lot of necrosis and necrosis attracts calcification as a dystrophy uh, the next question is that if there is a severe vitreous hemorrhage after uh, intravitreal melphalan then how would you manage that case well if there is vitreous hemorrhage and if you suspect that there is active tumor in the eye then the safest modality is to enucleate but what we do is we do imaging we can do three things one is b scan if if there is a significant tumor you will know with b scan or an mri or a positron emission tomography or a pet scan pet scan will tell us the viability so with all this if there is a high suspicion that there might be a viable tumor in the eye with vitreous hemorrhage the safest bet is to enucleate otherwise you can observe them with vitreous hemorrhage for about 6 weeks to 3 months but beyond 3 months if the hemorrhage is not regressing then we would enucleate uh the next question is what is your protocol for tct time and path mm -hmm. what is your protocol for it says tct what is the time and what is the power that tct okay i think it Yeah, TTT. So TTT, we use one thousand eight hundred micron spot size, one thousand three hundred micron spot size with an indirect ophthalmoscopy delivery system. So we can go right up to the aura, and uh, we use a twenty D lens. If you want a larger spot size, of course, you can change the power of the lens. That is one. Second is three hundred milliwatts is my starting power, and uh, I go up to thirty five spots. 300 to 800 is the range so i start with 300 go to the center of the tumor and uh, uh, apply five three to five spots and observe for color change if there is subtle change in color you don't get immediate laser reaction in ttt unlike photocoagulation so all you find is subtle change in color and the moment you observe subtle change in color that means that there is reaction 
you move to the next spot. If there is no change in color with 300, you move to 500 or even up to 800. And total number of spots is 35 because beyond that, you can induce a cataract. And uh, there's a question by Dr. Uh, Manoj Saswade, mm -hmm. your good friend, I think. And he wants to know, can we consider intravitreal uh, tropotecan as uh, monotherapy in absence of systemic spread? Well, no, it doesn't work for retinal tumors. Intravitreal chemotherapy works for two things. One is subretinal seed, intraretinal seed also it works, and vitreous seed or anterior chamber seed. So basically it works for seeds and not for tumors. For tumors, we have to go for systemic therapy or uh, focal therapy. Then uh, Dr. Nitin Travedi wants to know how frequently you get secondary tumors in other parts of the body after you have a primary uh, retinoblastoma. Well, it does not happen in unilateral unifocal tumor or non-heritable tumor, extremely, extremely rare. But if it's a unilateral multifocal tumor, it automatically becomes hereditary or bilateral or non-hereditary tumors. The range of uh, developing second malignant neoplasm over time, that is in lifetime, is 10 to 20%. It can be osteosarcoma to any tumor for that matter. We have even had patients developing sebaceous gland carcinoma in the eyelid. So any form of any tumor can develop anywhere in the body. And the highest incidence is in the second and the third decade of life. And as the patient ages, the incidence tapers down. So it is mandatory that we follow these patients up every year until they become at least 40 years of age. Beyond that, again, for some reasons, these... Uh, genes in those uh, cells switch off and uh, the incidence of second malignant neoplasm comes down. And if the child has received radiation of any form, then the chance of developing second malignant neoplasm is 35%. So the number uh, jumps if the child has received radiation. Uh, then there's uh, one more question by Dr. Shilpi Sharma. She wants to know, I think ever since our postgraduate days, we've learned this, that you should take more than 10 millimeters optic nerve excession for enucleation. So why, I mean, what is the rationale of, you know, taking more than 10 millimeters? Right. So rationale is just this, that if you have tumor at the dissection end, that is the worst prognostic factor for retinoblastoma. Worse in the sense that these children need 12 cycles of chemotherapy and a good dose of radiation. That complicates the management very badly. So we had a small study where we analyzed retrospectively, of course, Earlier, as you said, when we were PGs, we were taught 10 millimeter is enough. So we had patients right from, say, 1987, when Elif Prasada Institute started, to 1995, when I joined, and beyond. So we had a huge number of patients, and the risk of having transaction and positivity was highest when 10 millimeter optic nerve was taken, and it was lowest when the longest possible optic nerve was taken. Longest possible optic nerve is 2 millimeter from the orbital apex. If you go beyond that, then you'll be cutting through the superior orbital fissure, which is disadvantageous. So longest possible optic nerve versus 10 millimeter. There's a major difference in optic nerve transaction positivity. That is why we go for the longest possible stump. 15 millimeter is not the uh, measurement, but longest possible. Uh, Dr. Mayur Kulkarni wants to know how to manage one-eyed patient when one eye is already enucleated for retinoblastoma with active or inactive retinoblastoma in the other eye with retinal detachment? Right. So in those patients, uh, see one eye or two eye, the protocols remain the same. So if a patient has extensive retinoblastoma, as you described, then the best form of treatment is intra-arterial chemotherapy. Short of it, if that is expensive for the particular family, then intravenous chemotherapy, high dose or standard dose, that is how you start off with after three cycles of chemotherapy, you decide on what is the focal form of therapy that is best for the child. Retinal detachment, unless it is regmatogenous or tractional, settles down with chemotherapy, and that is a very good thing that can happen in retinoblastoma. If it is regmatogenous or tractional, then once the uh, tumor has regressed, we wait for a cool-off period of three to six months and then do a vitro-retinal surgery. So that is how the treatment goes. But the most important is to start off on chemotherapy. Uh, there's another question, uh, Dr. Avdesh Kumar Pandey wants to know if you could, you know, inform and tell more about the genetics of retinoblastoma. I mean, how many, I mean, if, if a child has retinoblastoma, then I did, I think you did explain, but what is the chance that the siblings will have or the future children will have? So if you can just be 
a little more elaborate on that? Yeah, sure. So anyway, one uh, AIOS is also organizing a sim international symposium on retinoblastoma where genetics is a talk. I think Dr. Usha Kim is giving it, so she will explain very much in detail. But just to be short, you know, if a child has heritable retinoblastoma and the parents have a mutation, then the sibling getting retinoblastoma empirical risk is 40%. If the child has non-heritable retinoblastoma and the parents don't have a mutation, then the children of the child developing retinoblastoma is still a minimal 4% because some of the mutations can be missed. Okay. Because no think, genetic test is 100% sensitive or specific. I think uh, that explains it all. And then on the Zoom channel, we have a question by Dr. Bani Rana and she's from Canada. She wants to know if the retinoblastoma patient removes if there are several treatments which are going on like intra-arterial and then you have chemotherapy as well and multiple treatments are there and if you enucleate the eye, then what are the chances that the child will survive and will not have a metastatic uh, you know, component to it? Well, see, irrespective of what treatment has been given to the child, you have to identify risk factors. Risk factors are identified at two levels. The first level is at the time of presentation. So primary presentation, we cannot have histopathological risk factors, but we have to evaluate clinical and radiological risk factors. Clinical risk factors I explained are very evident, neovascular glaucoma, infiltration of the anterior segment, and if obviously ciliary body involvement is present or not, hyphema is present or not, vitreous hemorrhage is present or not, asteroid or aseptic orbital cellulitis. These are the clinical risk factors. And on imaging, you can uh, look for choroidal invasion, optic nerve invasion, and also extraocular extension. These are the risk factors that you have at the primary presentation. So with these risk factors, you stratify the management. And finally, when the eye is enucleated, you have histopathological risk factors, which need to be identified. Even if you are given 12 cycles of chemotherapy, after that, the child has undergone enucleation and still has optic nerve invasion, which is viable for say 1.5 millimeter or more or choroidal invasion which is still viable for three millimeter uh, thickness or uh, width then you still have to give adjuvant chemotherapy despite the fact that you may have given chemotherapy earlier with all this put together survival is extremely good okay then uh, there's another question how many uh, intravenous when you're giving chemotherapy then how many maximum number of intravenous injections would you have given Right. Standard is six cycles. Six cycles is extremely safe. We don't go beyond six cycles generally, but in exceptions where the tumor is nearly regressed, but if we, we know that if we give a three cycles push, it will regress further, then we go on up to nine cycles. If a child has had a recurrence, then we can restart chemotherapy and give up to 12 cycles. Beyond 12 cycles is exceptional. If that is the only eye that is seeing eye, we cannot enucleate for that reason. And if intra-arterial chemotherapy is not possible because of, uh, say, arterial abnormality, there could be narrowing of the ophthalmic artery that precludes intra-arterial chemotherapy, then we can go up to 12 to 18 cycles. But the risk of uh, leukemia is higher if you go with higher number of cycles, especially etoposide is, uh, can cause secondary leukemia. And that is why you should be very aware of the fact that we can lose the child because of other reasons if we go too high on the number of chemotherapies. So I think uh, that is all about the questions uh, that were uh, there to answer. And again, I would like to thank you, Santosh, and I would like to request you to give us a pre-recorded talk of this. I'm sure uh, uh, we, for the want of time, uh, hurried up in the towards the end, but I'm sure if you give a pre-recorded talk, and especially the videos of sure. young children because that will help to increase awareness that retinoblastoma is curable and treatable. And thank you for your contributions to ophthalmology, to retinoblastoma, to ocular oncology. And uh, especially I know that every year in the retinoblastoma week, uh, you take it upon yourself and all the Oculoplasty Association of India and all the ocular oncologists take it upon themselves to uh, to make everybody aware about retinoblastoma. So thank you so much. Uh, would you like to say the last words before we close? I just want to thank you and AIS for all the help and support.
Thank you, thank you Santosh. We would like to thank our uh, support team, Mr. Sunil, Mr. Um, Kripal Rana, and uh, of course our uh, uh, audiovisual uh, department. So thank you so much for being with us today. And thank you, Santosh. Would you like to announce the next program of uh, uh, OPI, which we are going to have shortly? Right. So Dr. Namrita requested that uh, OPI should conduct the International Symposium on Retinoblastoma, which we are organizing on uh, 15th of uh, May. That will be a Saturday. Saturday, 7 o'clock, uh, 6 o'clock onwards, 6 to 9, uh, which is a star studded International Symposium. We are working on the program as we speak, and uh, we should be able to come up with a program in the next two or three days. So that will be uh, covering the entire uh, retinoblastoma, including genetics and pathology, in much more detail than I could, and uh, obviously with much more knowledge, those uh, international authorities have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Santosh. Thank you.